Yeah, hello, welcome to our fourth live stream of Tech Rules Uncovered. This is the series of live events where we are talking about different roles in tech, but also about the career journey of our guests. As you know, this is a live event and you can participate or add value to this format by asking questions, but also sharing your experience or adding any other comment to the comment sections of LinkedIn and YouTube. Feel free if you have anything that you want to ask our guests to add that in the comments and then we will answer that during our stream. Today's topic and today's role that we are talking about is the platform engineer. And for this, I invited an amazing guest. And during my research, I was quite impressed about his broad experience about the different um, topics in tech that he already worked with. So he started or has experience with uh, web development, but he also worked as a software architect. He has experience with data engineering, business analytics and machine learning, and the list is still continuing. And now he has also experience with platform engineer, which I'm really happy to talk with him today. He worked at Autoscout24, but also at Twitter. And recently he joined Personio as a lead platform engineer. I'm really happy to have him here today and I'm very excited. Say hello to Martin Lechner. Hi folks uh, and thank you um, Sarah for having me here. Um, I'm super excited about this um, opportunity to have a, a chat with you and um, also present platform engineering to a wider audience and um, also happy to answer all of your, your questions which might arise um, around platform engineering but uh, also like um, general software engineering topics. That was a great introduction. Thank you, Martin. So the pleasure is especially on my side. I'm really happy that you take the time, especially during uh, this very nice weather outside and that we are going to talk a little bit about platform engineering and especially your career journey and your current role. But before we dig deep into the topic, um, you know already that I prepared some either or questions for you. And I also want to start with that. If you're ready, then we can start. Ready whenever you are. <laughs> Best answer. So the first question is quite easy, I would say. So do you prefer working from home office or do you prefer going to the office? Um, it's actually um, a super interesting question. Um, I personally prefer a hybrid approach. Um, I really believe in um, social interactions with other people, um, and it's and it has been proven for me throughout my career that it's super valuable to meet with your coworkers. From mm -hmm. a pure like productivity perspective, um, I find more peace and focus at home. Um, so. Right now, um, at at Personio, we have like a Personio flex, where the expectation is around that people are fifty percent in the office and can work fifty percent from home, which um, seems to be an awesome mix for me. Mm -hmm. Nice. So you have the flexibility, and you definitely take that. Nice. So my second question: I know that you studied in Munich. I think you also live near Munich, if I'm correct. So um, where is, or yeah, where can we most like you meet you in Munich? Is it either at Allianz Arena or in, on the Wiesen, Oktoberfest, <laughs> or is it in English Garden? I think that's also an um, interesting question, given um, I hadn't been... Um, in Munich for quite a while um, before joining Personio. Um, overall, um, I'm a bit more drawn to the nature, so mm -hmm. um, most likely you could even find me at the um, Amasee, which is pretty close mm -hmm. to where I live. So on the weekends, um, I um, enjoy some 
a bicycle tour with my family to the lake, having like an awesome, um, awesome ice cream, doing a bit mm -hmm. of um, stand up um, paddling, and yeah. <laughs> nice. Sounds like a plan. So I'm gonna say, and the summer is coming. So find you near the lake. Nice. So next question, um, either or, do you prefer macOS or Linux? Um, given that I have been working exclusively on Mac since uh, like, I don't know, 10 years now, mm -hmm. um, it's an easy question for me. Um, I really um, enjoy the UX uh, of Mac and that it's like just works without um, fiddling around too much. Um, although my private computer uh, is Linux based um, because I was like looking for a lightweight um, all, um, alternative um, and I wasn't looking for like everything working out of the box, maximum ef um, efficiency. So yeah, for working for sure it's Mac for like mm -hmm. private tinkering around. Linux <laughs> is pretty cool. Oh, nice. So for work, so at Pozonio, you're using Mac, if I, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the fourth question, um, I saw you have a blog and you have your own website. It's, um, I have to, to take lechner.work and where you can find some background information about you. And there's also a section about books that you are recommending. And um Which of these two books would you most likely read for a second time? Is it Advanced Scala with Cats or is it Better, Alley, Better Alleys? Um, given that I'm not working with um, Scala anymore um, and I really see like benefits uh, in enabling other people um, and I see this as like part of my lead role, um, mm -hmm. I'm picking a better um, allies be, um, uh, um, because it like really focuses uh, on helping other people in underrepresented groups, especially women, um, mm -hmm. to um, get like better careers and like a better standing, um, mm -hmm. which I find really important. In my opinion, we have uh, a very bad... Um, percentage of like females in software engineering um, and I ho hope that like one day um, um, it will change. Fun mm -hmm. fact, um, it seems to be a very European thing. For instance, in like India, the percentage is much higher. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it um, basically also gives some food for thought for the country leaders uh, and the education leaders um, if we are like influencing women uh, into the wrong direction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Really, really cool. So that is something, a book recommendation that we will also um, link into our uh, video that is going to be online after our talk. So it was called Better Allies. It's about how to create inclusive workplaces. So thank you very much. Last but not least, last uh, introduction question. You're a co coffee lover. So <laughs> would you prefer to drink an espresso or a manual brew coffee? Uh, um, in general, I really enjoy um, doing my manual brews. Um, and... Um, If given the choice, I'm like most of the time preferring this. Um, when I'm in a hurry, I think an espresso works out better because like the preparation time for like a manual brew, um, heating up water, mm -hmm. grinding, um, and then so doing some like ritual, uh, taking, I don't know, four to five minutes. And with an espresso, I put the beans into the grinder run it through the template, get it out. And it's like, I don't know, 45, 50 seconds, maybe. So um, for quickness, um, I really prefer the espresso, but uh, my love is with the manual brewing methods. 
Beautiful. <laughs> I don't know if that uh, went out to the audience outside. I just posted um, the blog post that you were written about coffee. It was really amazing. I enjoy I enjoyed reading it. And yeah, that was the start, the introductory question. Thank you very much. Um, now we know you already a little bit better. But um, of course, we also want to hear your introduction. So maybe if you could briefly introduce yourself. What are you doing? Where are you working? Um, yeah, Martin, um, I'm happy to hear about your story. Cool. Thank you, Sarah. Um, my name is Martin, as <laughs> mentioned already. <laughs> um, I'm currently working as a lead platform engineer at Personio. Um, Personio is a... European um, HR software scale-up. Um, we have around 8,000 customers in Europe um, and we're growing every day. Um, mm -hmm. There have been some like funding rounds. Um, it's a unicorn, so the valuation um, um, at the time of the last funding round was over 1 billion euros. Um, And we're um, massively hiring right now for like staff and senior roles, mm -hmm. both in like platform engineering and like also in a product engineer where um, other companies are firing people. Um, mm -hmm. Overall, I really enjoy the um, spirit of the company and the people um, and the culture there is real. Um, I, um, I've met so many awesome people um, as like part of my role um, I really can recommend working there mm -hmm. um, maybe a bit more about myself then um, I used to um, study bioinformatics in Munich mm -hmm. um, then switched over for the masters to computer science um, during my studies I was working as a working student in, the, um, in like various places, which I can highly recommend to um, all of the listeners, especially if you're um, still like studying, um, this is valuable um, experience you would miss out. Mm -hmm. um, after studying, um, I was working for four years in, um, um, in a contracting company called Yambit. Um, mm -hmm. In there, we were doing software projects with um, a wide array of customers from known newspapers to known car manufacturers um, to um, also some like smaller companies. Um, even um, I was working with a startup, um, working on a, um, on a very cool product. Um, and then afterwards, I had the feeling that I needed to move like from this consulting angle more into like a product angle because it's like a different way of working um, mm -hmm. and uh, when I get bored I'm looking for <laughs> new experiences and you'll see that throughout my career <laughs> <laughs> definitely I saw that <laughs> um, so um, I joined Autoscout uh, 24 um, at the time when I joined there it was one of the most advanced um, tech companies in Munich, uh, if we like factor out maybe like the big um, players such mm -hmm. as Google. Um, um, and I spent there also around four years. Um, I started um, as a senior uh, and when the uh, um, tech lead of the team left, um, I stepped first into like a tech lead role um, and, um, and with in the end of the tenure there, um, I was also working um, on company level um, initiatives um, and also on like steering the tech ecosystem um, of mm -hmm. the company basically. And this is also like where I got my first experiences with like platform engineering. So we had some like platform engineering there, but um, it was mostly focused on like infrastructure and tooling. So like infrastructure and like tooling. Um, and what I was really missing from a, from a developer perspective was like a focus on developer experience, mm -hmm. like things which should be easy were hard, um, like, um, bootstrapping a 
new service with the um, latest uh, best practices which we had at the company um, establishing um, establishing new ways of working um, and then we founded basically uh, a small like part-time working group focusing on this where um, I could dedicate 20% um, of my time. Mm -hmm. um, shout out to um, Inyaki, um, Adam, <laughs> uh, Laka, and um, Diego. Um, it, it was a really cool group, um, highly self-contained um, and still like providing, in my opinion, a lot of value to um, the company. For instance, we were um, rolling out um, a new tool for deployment, which is mm -hmm. the um, AWS CDK. Um, mm -hmm. Before that, we were writing basically um, deployments in cloud formation. Um, and this is a YAML file format. And this is like super, super for both. So um, you would basically define all of the resources which you need for your application on the cloud infrastructure um, and needed to like specify um, all of the fields um, and like manually create the links between the components. Because for instance, your service needs to read from like a database. Um, this is like, I don't know, 50 lines of um, cloud formation. Mm -hmm. um, and with the new tool, um, it gave us a bit more like a programmatic approach to this, um, which then meant basically this 50 lines were like one line. Mm -hmm. um, and with that, the deployment experience become a lot better. Um, the, um, the application descriptions basically became more expressive uh, and we've seen like a um, high benefit. Um, also, this allowed uh, to um, establish some common standards um, across the company with regards to like tagging your infrastructure components um, in a good way, um, writing tests for your infrastructure. I mean, this wasn't really like possible bef be um, before and afterwards. Um, it, um, it became possible. Mm -hmm. um, and I think like that was one of the examples which we're mm. which we were doing there now we are already really deep inside the topic <laughs> so thank you for the insights however i think it's quite um like beneficial if uh, you could also give like a brief introduction what is platform engineering in general so 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 what it is and what's the main goal of platform engineering um i think you'll find like a million different uh, ways of describing that um, and like depending on whom you ask you get like different answers here mm -hmm. my vision here is that platform engineering serves to reduce cognitive load on on developers um, mm -hmm. and this is like manifold so mm -hmm. um, imagine you're a developer and you want to develop something you need to care about how do you deploy your things? On which infrastructure is it mm -hmm. running? How do I write the tests? Um, can I reuse um, existing best practices? Do I have like linting formatting for my mm -hmm. stuff? Um, and I think like one of the goals of platform engineering uh, is to um, enable people to not uh, reinvent the wheel um, mm -hmm. and make it easy to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. um, and what I can observe recently is more of like a split in platform engineering into two like main areas. There is like this infrastructure engineering side of things, which is m mainly focused on like providing some like um, underlying infrastructures such as Kubernetes, um, managing some cloud infrastructures like AWS or Google. Uh, or Google Cloud Platform or Azure, um, providing, I don't know, like databases for users, um, running, I don't know, Kafka, running Kubernetes. Mm -hmm. um, 
And on the other hand, um, and this is where I'm currently working in, it's like developer experience. We mm -hmm. aim to um, um, enable developers to um, focus more on um, on the business logic and care less um, about the um, technical parts um, and mm -hmm. the repetitive parts. Mm -hmm. So could you also give us an example on what you are currently working on at Personio, especially regarding developer experience and how to improve it? Um, yeah, sure. So for, um, for instance, um, one of the things um, I had been working on is um, e um, integrating uh, our uh, Canary deployment solution. So this is uh, a solution for like progressive um, uh, um, deployments, which aims to um, basically make deploying software more safe um, mm -hmm. by um, gradually like shifting over the traffic from the old version to the new version. So you have like two versions of your application running in parallel and you gradually shift over traffic um, and um, observe some metrics, for instance, latencies or success rates. And mm -hmm. um, if the latencies or success rates become bad, you roll back basically to the old version. And um, the signals in there, um, which we had available, were basically limited to one metrics provider. And uh, we also use another metrics um, service called Datadog, which is pretty mm -hmm. widely um, known. Um, and uh, one of my tasks uh, was like rolling out this um, integration with Datadog and the Canary solution um, and um, making it easy for the people to use. Mm -hmm. Because in the end, um, around there, you have to configure some like credentials which the deployment system needs to like I talk to the metrics provider. Um, you need to um, build some metric um, queries. So we created some like sane defaults, which people can easily use and plug into their service, basically. Mm -hmm. So deployment is still at the product teams, so to say, but the kind of tools and platform and services that they are using are provided by your team, right? Exactly. Mm -hmm. So in the end, we are following a you build it, you run it principle. So mm -hmm. um, the teams are basically responsible for running their um, software and making sure that it works um, and the various platform teams are are providing tools from like deployment over to like observability um, understanding metrics and um, getting for instance alarms uh, if the service is malfunctioning for mm -hmm. whatever reason um, mm -hmm. um, yeah in that sense we are um, enabling basically this capability mm -hmm. great really interesting and really hard to imagine uh, to have such a team in a small company. So probably you most often find platform teams in tech companies with multiple development teams participating or collaborating with platform teams so that it makes sense to also establish a platform team, isn't it? I think the um, value of having people caring for the platform aspect of things is um, actually like starting pretty early. So even mm -hmm. if you have only two teams, probably having one or two people who care about like the shared things like infra um, and like um, advocating there for like best practices is um, most likely um, already uh, cost beneficial um, mm -hmm. so 
Um, I wouldn't say it's only linked to um, bigger places. Um, in the end, of course, the more engineers you have, the um, more sophisticated platform you can build, basically, because um, you get more resources um, for hiring more people um, into your you like platform teams and um, and with that you can go deeper into um, each of those um, topics um, mm -hmm. over, um, overall um, as I explained like platform engineering is super wide and you can do a lot of things um, and I th um, and like one of the market um, trends I can see is that um, there's also like a lot of um, startups coming up to uh, with the promise to help um, smaller companies with the um, with the platform engineering um, and getting their developer experience right. Mm. So for the people watching live right now, do you also have experience with platform engineering or developer experience? I think Martin and me, we would be really in, yeah, like excited to see uh, if there are people watching that are also working in the same field. And second, if you have any questions for Martin about his career journey or about platform engineering, whatever it is, feel free to drop your questions and we are happy to answer them. Um, coming back to your journey. So it happened that you found interest in the topic of platform engineering, maybe also specifically developer experience all already during Autoscout 24. Um, what happened in between and what, what exactly involved or developed inside of yourself? What kind of experience did you do in order to decide to go for a lead platform engineering role like this year? So you started at Personio at the beginning of this year. And that's the <coughs> first time that you have like this role specifically in your career track. Um, the short answer is um, <laughs> um, Elon Musk happened. <laughs> okay. The um, longer um, answer is um, I was working a few months with um, Twitter. Um, mm -hmm. Was there on like a senior software engineer mm -hmm. role with um, a very cool team. Um, also working on um, providing values to um, SMBs um, mm -hmm. and making things easier for like SMB um, advertisers. Mm -hmm. um, and then out of nowhere, um, half of my team was fired. <laughs> oh. um, and then like two weeks later, there was that um, mail from Elon uh, with like fork in the road. Um, do you opt into hardcore engineering or not and at mm -hmm. that time um, I was basically on a remote contract um, mm -hmm. and it, it meant for me that uh, with everything which Elon said that like remote will be cancelled um, it would not be a wise um, choice to like opt in um, mm -hmm. and then like a couple of days later my access to everything was rev <laughs> revoked out of the blue um, okay. um, and then I was like starting to look for a new job in December and like end of December also like the situation with um, Twitter has cleared out um, and then end of um, end of January I was out um, and then I was like um, starting at at Personio, um in the beginning of February and why platform engineering um, I really wanted to go a bit um, deeper into um, into the um, area and focus more and like learn more about it. Um, and what's a like better way of learning than doing it? So I'm like a learning by doing mm -hmm. kind of person. Um, so I just applied um, and uh, they hired me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, And I think like what I'm bringing here to the table is like 
wide experience in the industry, um, especially um, as well in like product um, engineering orgs, uh, also in like big tech orgs. Um, and when Personi wants to scale, I think it's needed um, to have that kind of experience on board. Um, mm -hmm. And I had some super um, um, positive like interviews with the team, with my future manager. So it was basically a no brainer to um, mm -hmm. sign up with um, Personi and like I try this out. That is great. So learning by doing person, this is something that we have to remember. <laughs> we uh, received a question by Alona. It would be interesting to hear how your role at Personio is different from what you had been doing at Twitter. Especially, I think, because you also switched from, from software engineering to platform engineering. Um, it's a super interesting question. Thank you so much for that. So um, at Twitter, um, you can imagine we had like a lot of people um, and um, at Twitter, like the overall product wasn't super huge. So each of the teams was laser focused on like one very small area of the product. Um, and it was um, a um, full product team there. So we had like a product manager, engineer manager, also like data people um, mm -hmm. and then some like full stack engineers, iOS engineers on the team. So um, they're basically, um, the focus was really on like shipping software um, mm -hmm. and providing value to end users. And mm -hmm. here um, it's a bit um, different um, because uh, the whole um, topic of DX is super wide. Um, also the topics my current team has is super wide right now. Um, and our focus isn't uh, on like the end users, but really uh, on like enabling other um, other developers. And I think this is the key difference here. Um, mm -hmm. Also, I think like the success metrics, uh, if you're like working on advertising is more on focused around um, saving, uh, making money and or saving money by like reducing infrastructure costs and whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, and at like platform engineering, um, at least uh, our North um, star is uh, the four key metrics as popularized by the book um, Accelerate, which mm -hmm. I can also recommend to um, anyone looking into like DevOps uh, and uh, research um, in that um, area. This is really insightful so we um, aim to um, reduce the lead time to production um, enable faster recovery in case we have incidents ha have like a lower change failure rate so essentially like lower um, amount of incidents um, mm -hmm. so yeah um, I think this is like the um, the key difference here mm -hmm. That is really interesting. That was also a question that I had on my list uh, asking you about how you can measure the improvement of developer experience. So it's these four metrics that you just mentioned that you are working on together with your team. And that is also the metrics that you and your personal performance is measured by, right? So it's the like time to recovery, for example, and, and what you mentioned. That's exactly what it is. Um, I think like for the overall picture, we need to um, get a bit more deep, right? Because mm -hmm. in the um, end, um, those are basically like delivery metrics. Um, mm -hmm. The other part to the equation is basically how happy are the developers with mm -hmm. um, our offerings uh, and, and products and um, and for that, for instance, you can um, run some surveys, um, calculate some um, scorings, basically, out of mm -hmm. that. Um, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. ah, okay, so it's a quantitative approach on the software and technical side, but also more or less a qualitative survey that you are regularly asking the developers how satisfied they are with the 
services that you are providing to them. Exactly. Oh, okay. Nice. We have one comment from Tobias. Hi, Tobias. We also had a similar platform team like you described, Martin, at Brighter. I had a huge impact on reducing cognitive load and improve developer experience and I would say developer platforms, DP. Productivity, probably. Ah, okay. <laughs> developer productivity. Good. So um, thanks to Bias um, for sharing your experience. Um, coming to the heart of our talk, of course, we also want to know how you spend your time on a like average basis. And I also ask you to provide me with some data. Um, yeah, so that's what it is. So you said that like most of the time, already 45% of your time, you are spending Spending with coding and what is also special for you is that you are lead platform engineer with, which might differ a little bit from other team members but I think that is something that we can uh, add on later so maybe can you explain us a little bit what exactly are you doing when you are saying you're coding 45% of your time um, my team is basically providing some services um, and like tools for the rest of the um, organization. Um, and while there is um, always this like build versus buy mm -hmm. question, um, in um, some cases, it really makes um, sense to build our own custom tools. Mm -hmm. um, for instance, uh, One thing which we're not super happy with is like GitLab and how it integrates with um, Slack. So we're investing here a bit now um, into like making this frictionless um, and like mm -hmm. um, and like automate away certain things which um, developers repeatedly do. Like mm -hmm. we see behavior which developers do manually. Um, mm -hmm. And then we'd like try to automate it away. Um, mm -hmm. And this is like where the the coding is uh, spent. In retrospect, now looking at these numbers, maybe it's a bit less on the coding side and more mm -hmm. on like influencing and like training okay. um, and mm -hmm. like um, being active and answering uh, questions. But um, overall, I think, yeah, this, this is like Yeah. Roughly, the Roughly. <laughs> it's. I think it's it's clear that uh, your week and your week, uh, your work day is uh, changing constantly, and also you are still quite new at the company, so probably it would also change over time. But forty five percent is coding, so it's about um, providing interfaces, connecting services. Uh, what else is there more to mention for coding? Well, I mean, I don't really say that. Um, so we aren't like writing some like product engineering code, right? Um, <laughs> and um, it seems like we should connect Marty with Manuel Krabowski from GitLab, who was the guest at our first <laughs> episode uh, because he's a pod engineer. So probably we will connect awesome. you with him asking, <laughs> asking him for advice. <laughs> Sorry, but now I interrupted you. <laughs> No, so um, yes, yeah, like mostly the coding work is on like internal tools. Um, also, like sometimes helping people with their like technical problems, um, helping people in like pair programming sessions uh, to like adopt our tools, um, mm -hmm. especially if we roll out new features uh, and there's a few like early adopters. You cannot get everything right from the from the beginning, so you need to have like a short feedback cycle, be, um, basically between what you build uh, and the people starting to um, adopt it. Um, and um, unless you really nail the documents and um, caught every corner case, the product engineers have and find. Um, There's also um, always this like support function um, involved, and I've also included this more in like the coding part because it's also really like deeply technical work, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. And then continuing, um, you have 20% of your time spending in meetings. What kind of meetings do you have at Personio and which one do you attend as a lead platform engineer? So there is like um, the usual team meetings like a daily we have like a retro mm -hmm. some like hangout with, mm -hmm. with the team because we are um, also like distributed across europe mm -hmm. um and then there is like typical all hands meetings some like leadership rounds uh mm -hmm. some company wide technical sync rounds um yeah there's a, um and then of course i'm also like meeting with um other people sometimes also from like the product engineering org to gather feedback, get some insights um, and get close to the pulse of what's happening. Mm -hmm. Are meetings mandatory at Personio? Because we already discussed <clears throat> that in another episode. So in the end, um, I think the stance is that if you don't provide value to a meeting, You should skip the meeting and like leave mm -hmm. the meeting <laughs> even. Um, and we're actively like trying to reduce the amount of overall meetings because it's having like a high um, impact on the free um, time. In my mm -hmm. role as a lead platform engineer, it's not seeming excessively high to be in 20% uh, meetings. Actually, mm -hmm. I think this is rather low compared to some previous places where I was in meetings all day. <laughs> <laughs> okay, already a huge improvement, so to say. Okay, so 15% of your time uh, goes into concept and design. What exactly are you doing? In the end, we are looking at um, the problems which our customers have and like try to find solutions um, mm -hmm. usually we work in smaller groups and um, to like prepare some like analysis on a topic um, and mm -hmm. then like discuss it in the team and then refine and re um, iterate on that um, until we reach a basically an agreement within the team like how we can solve the problem and this is then before we really like start implementing mm -hmm. so i think the code reviewer uh, i think it's quite clear so working <laughs> working quite technically on changes or um yeah features that teammates created training is it uh people that you train or your own training your own yeah career development what do you mean by that um It's really like me training people. Mm -hmm. So that um, can either be some like one-to-one -one conversations on like mentoring, coaching aspects, um, or um, also running some sessions for the team. Um, when I feel like we can do something better, it's usually good to not complain about it, but present a solution, you know. Mm -hmm. um, And I am finding this um, as like um, training. Mm -hmm. And the last one is quite interesting. It's uh, influencing. And probably that also fits to this question that we received. Do you need to justify the existence of your team? How do you measure? Ah, th I think that's two questions. Probably the first one. How do you need to justify the existence of your team? Is that something that corresponds to influencing or do you mean something completely different? Um, influencing means more um, being really um, close to the product engineers, um, mm -hmm. understanding the needs, but um, also helping out people um, to which do not know our solutions mm -hmm. well um, and mm -hmm. understand everything. It's more of like a developer relationships aspect, mm -hmm. basically. Um, understand. Also yeah. doing a bit of like um, networking with other lead engineers um, in like mm -hmm. other areas to um, um, get basically some like 
direct input. So mm -hmm. I mean, we have like multiple ways of getting user feedback. We have like Slack channels. We have some like Jira service desk um, process. We have um, some tool where people can put in suggestions and can like upvote this. Um, mm -hmm. All of this is valuable, but I strongly believe that like personal interaction with people is invaluable. Mm -hmm. um, and to the question of Toby, uh, no, we don't need to um, um, justify the um, existence of the team. Um, we are in a very fortunate position that um, our senior leadership um, is coming from all of our big tech where it's super common to have like platform engineering. Um, at least I don't have to like justify the <laughs> um, existence um, of, um, of the team. Um, um, in the end, when it comes to like um, growing the platform engineering team, um, it's probably like a different story, but um, I think this is like more on the head of the department level who um, has to bring up arguments why we need more people. Um, um, and like mentioning the senior leadership, we like recently hired people from Meta, Twitter, um, like another VP of engineering is from Uber. So this is like a pretty uh, high, um, basically like standards of the leadership. Um, and um, I mean, they've seen the platforms within the respective um, the companies, I can only speak for Twitter, but what the platform teams were doing there is like super um, sophisticated um, and um, each team was like also focusing only on a very narrow a part of the um, platform and um, it also made us like super effective. But for this, um, I think you always need to have like a healthy balance between like platform engineers and product engineers because in the end, the product engineers is for uh, other people who like provide the real business value, while like platform engineering is more like a support function, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I don't fully know the percentage now. Um, here it's probably something like eight to one to like ten to one out of my head, uh, and I think. Um, at least to me, it feels kind of healthy right now. Hmm. Great. I have nothing to add here. The one thing that I uh, recognize is sometimes you are talking about customers, sometimes about users, and sometimes about developers. In the end, your clients, your customers are always the developers. So if you are talking yeah. about clients... It's always the developers. Uh, we have one more question. And uh, Martin, we are already a bit over time. Do you still have All some good. minutes to, to answer this question? All good. So we have another one from Alona. Martin, <laughs> <laughs> do you have any advice for recruiters who reach out to you? What are the three main things that you want to see in the first outreach? Um, I think like one of the biggest mistakes I'm seeing recruiters make is not including some upfront numbers on compensation. Mm -hmm. um, I'd really also like to see um, what the position is even about. Um, and third thing, I'm also always like curious about the uh, company culture. Like, mm. what is it to work there, uh, what are the people people about? Um, do you have some like company values which you can share some vision? And um, actually, um, I think this is also one of the um, things where my current employer personas has been super um, transparent about. You can find um, the company values and the company operating principles on the internet, which is super great. Yeah, um, true. And then um, um, it's like easy to figure out uh, when you're doing like reverse interviewing. Um, so for me, like interviewing isn't only that the company interviews me, but also that I'm interviewing the company. So I have like a sheet of, I don't know, 50 questions um, out of 
which I'm like pulling fitting um, the questions to like figure out if the culture is real, if this is like an environment I can imagine working on. Um, so yeah, I think, and um, now that I recall it, um, I think what always helps if like recruiters reach out is to not have this like standard email which you send to like one thousand people. <laughs> like I'm. Um, That's true. <laughs> Most of those. And I, actually, I never have found a job through like recruiter spam on LinkedIn or mm. thing. Um, most of this was through like network or like me finding a cool company. Yeah. This is something that I can 100% agree with. So if you receive this recruiting spam that is completely yeah not even linked to your profile sometimes they don't even mention your names you, you know exactly that they are <laughs> sending them uh, like this same request to thousands of people and this is not really attractive to to people that have already seen some some things so uh, yeah thank you very much alona for your question and last but not least i see that Manu is also <laughs> watching us. Hi, Manu <laughs> from GitLab. So no agenda, no attender. That was his um, comment on this meeting section. And we learned it already in the first episode. So if this is new to you, audience, uh, have a look in our first episode together with Manu. And so now you can be sure that Manu is um, writing you after the talk about this GitLab integration to Slack. So I'm, I'm quite sure about that. So if there are, I think there are no more questions left. Um, and then I would say I still have so many questions on my list, but I think that would definitely um, take a little bit longer uh, to answer all of them. So we definitely have to uh, come back to this topic probably in the future. And if you, yeah, if you like it, uh, we can definitely make um, like a second episode, maybe in autumn or whatever. If you already, um, yeah, developed like over over time uh, in this role, and if you have even more experience to to bring. Last but not least, I have a final question to ask you, Martin. So, for all those people, engineers outside that are thinking about platform engineering to join a platform team or to become a platform engineer themselves. Are there any books, any websites, any blogs, anything that you would recommend to them to read or to to take a look in in order to yeah to, to learn a little bit more plat about platform engineering? I think what helps is like the general classics um, around like DevOps mm -hmm. mythology, um, the Phoenix Project, for instance, and mm -hmm. there's um, Accelerate. Um, then I really enjoy the newsletter uh, from the uh, from um, getdx.com. Mm -hmm. um, he's um, covering um, a lot of interesting questions. Um, in general, I re um, I really recommend following some people on Twitter or um, I don't know what's in the future. Mm -hmm. There is like the CEO and um, CTO of Honeycomb. Um, Charity Majors and uh, Liz Fong Jones. Um, mm -hmm. Those are cool follows with like inspiration. Um, there is uh, at Sean Kassor at uh, Twitter. Um, she's the um, CEO um, of another um, observability company. Um, yeah. In general, um, I think what also really helps to get into platform engineering is being like a good overall software engineer. Um, one of the recent books I've read, which I can recommend to everybody is Modern Software Engineering by um, um, Dave Farley. Um, he mm -hmm. also wrote, uh, I think it was called Continuous Integration or Continuous Delivery, like one of those um, the classic books. Um, and while this is also like included, um, it's going a bit more deep into like a scientific approach to um, software engineering, which is, uh, I think, really valuable. Um, mm -hmm. 
We will definitely have to add all those uh, valuable resources to the event links. Um, I will definitely come back to you um, asking for all the links and then we will provide it um, like for the audience also to take a look in all those great books and uh, especially uh, following the persons on Twitter. So thank you very much, Martin. You now have the high score for the longest episode. So I'm <laughs> you <laughs> definitely congratulations on that. Thank you very much for your time and giving us uh, so many insights and um, yeah, an overview about platform engineering and your job and how you developed into this role. Um, if you um, yeah, are interested to join our live event next week, next week, Thursday, we have Manuel Vogel with us. He is AWS Evangelist uh, at Kreuzwerker. I have no clue what this role actually is. So I'm really excited to learn more about that. If you're also excited, join me, ask your questions, uh, share your experience. I'm really happy to see you again next week. And until then, um, yeah, have a nice evening, enjoy and see you. Bye, Martin. Bye-bye and uh, thank you for the conversation. And if you want, um, I'll be back for season two. Yes, we will definitely do that. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Cool. Bye-bye. See you around.